Hi, we'd like to welcome everybody to our journey to self-advocacy in the use of assistive technology. We are the Oregon branch of the IDA Student Empowerment Group. We have a group of students who speaks throughout the state um, and into Washington, and we've gone across country. And we talk about our journey to how we advocate for ourselves and how it's a growth and our journey into using assistive technology. So we welcome you. We thank you for being here and we hope that you're all doing well. So I'd like to introduce you to one of our board members, Jared, to talk a little bit about something that's exciting for us. It's a new running distance student scholarship, and we'll let Jared explain a little bit about it. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this past fall, we got together and in the spring launched our scholarship program, which uh, consists of four $1,000 scholarships um which can potentially be renewable as well but it's really going to support students with dyslexia and learning challenges and give them opportunities to go on in their endeavors post high school um, we have more information about these scholarships on our website um, by going to or.dyslexiaida um, so to read more about it but the general the general feeling about these scholarships is that we wanted to support people going into their next endeavor, be it um, a four year college, um, a junior college of some sort, or if they have some business like endeavors that they want to partake in, um, finding the right classes and programs for them to be able to go into. So we hope you will read more about it and also you can, uh, if you're interested in contributing, you can donate to the campaign as well. Thank you, Shelby. We'd like to remind everybody um, that if they'd like to ask questions, I know that you're all muted. So if you could use the question and answer, and if we can get to you tonight, we will. And if not, we will go through the questions and um, get those answered for you. So if you have a question for a specific person, go ahead and maybe um, mark what student or who you'd like to speak to, and um, we will try to get back to you quickly. We all. So are recording this and so hopefully um, if you have any questions you can look back and um, watch it again. So the next person I'd like to introduce is Danielle Thompson. She is the president of the Oregon branch of the IDA and she's going to talk to us a little bit and take us through the next couple slides. Good evening. At IDA, our mission is to raise awareness and understanding of dyslexia, to promote effective intervention strategies, and to support individuals with dyslexia, their families, and professionals in our community. We're striving to create a future for all individuals who have dyslexia and other related reading differences so that they may have richer and more robust lives and access to the tools and the resources they need. And tonight you'll hear from our experts on what tools and resources they find most helpful. Uh, in order to set that up though, we wanted to take you through a couple short activities um, to help drive home um, why assistive technology can be um, such a, a groundbreaker for our students. So in an email that went out last night with the Zoom link, um, I gave you some instructions to have a piece of paper and something to write with. And if you could gather that right now, um, I'll have you do something for me. And while you're doing that, um, I'd like to give a little shout out to all the IDA members that are with us tonight. And if you're not a member of IDA, I would ask that you consider joining this organization because not only do you lend your voice to your local and your national movements, for literacy, you also are lending your voice to a worldwide movement until everyone can read. And I find the access to the professional journals, the research, um, updates on not only dyslexia science, but reading science 
and neuroscience and cognitive science to be very helpful um, to help the students that I work with. All right, I hope you have your paper, something to write with. Um, this first activity, uh, what I'd like for you to do is write with your non-dominant hand. Um, and I'm gonna have you act as if you are in my class. You come in every day and you take out your agenda or your daily planner and you write down the assignment that's on the board while I'm taking attendance. So that's your do now activity. Uh, please write down um, the assignment that's due tomorrow. Uh, and please write it with your non-dominant hand. Should be pretty quick. Go ahead, Shelby. All right, this assignment, um, like I said, due tomorrow, it's worth a million points. Um, just jot it down really quickly while we check and make sure everybody's here, okay? Shelby? No, go ahead and go back. I was taking attendance, you're here. <laughs> All right, we've got Jared. We've got Jane, Andrew, Betsy. We've got Mary, James, Jesus. We've got Mac, Emma, Macy, Sarah, Bella, Meg, Madeline. I think we're good. All right, you guys should have it. All right, tomorrow, okay? First thing, have that ready to go when you come into class. Shelby, thanks. What you may have experienced if you were trying to write that assignment down is um, maybe an unfamiliarity with Welsh um, as that passage was written. You also may have had difficulties um, because you had to pay attention to the letter by letter transcription. Um, you had to look off a screen. You didn't have very much time to do it. And we gave you some difficulties with the active handwriting and using your non-dominant hand. And what you were writing didn't have any familiar spelling patterns if you don't know Welsh. And you may have wondered what, what I was doing and you're trying to tune in what names I was calling versus what you were supposed to do with writing that assignment down in your planner. That type of activity can make note taking really difficult and our students will talk about some of the things that are more helpful than that type of assignment. All right, let's do another one. Uh, on that same paper, either on the back or just further down the page, um, I'd like to have you experience for a second or more than a second, um, what it feels like where you have limited spelling or you're unable to get your great ideas out of your head onto paper. Um, and so the first task I'd like for you to do is you can use the hand that you usually write with, your dominant hand, and can you write a paragraph about what you did this morning? And there are like no restrictions or limitations. So go ahead and do that now. Tell me about what you did today. Or write about what you did today. Don't forget to be using those rich vocabulary words that we've been working on to help make our writing sort of pop to the reader. We wanna appeal to their senses so that we can see and hear and feel and taste and touch whatever it is that you did this morning. And come to a stopping point on the sentence that you're on. All right. Now I'd like to impose some restrictions on you. I'd like to have you write a second paragraph about what you did yesterday. But this time you have some restrictions that are on the next slide. I'll also read them to you. Um, in this part, you may not use certain words. And so Shelby, go ahead and change that over if it will go. You cannot use the words um, A, and, B, for, have, in, of, that, the, and to. So you may not use those words. And when you're spelling, could you please substitute a T for every time you would use the letter B and substitute an A for every time you would use the letter O. 
And we'd like this to be your best handwriting so that we can put it up for family night. So try to have everything spelled correctly in your head before you write it down so that you don't have any cross outs on your paper. All right, this should be easy for you because you just lived through this yesterday. So go ahead and get started on that paragraph and see if you can fill the page. Don't forget to incorporate those vocabulary words we've been working on. I can't wait to read about what your day was like yesterday. I bet it was amazing. All right, I can see by some people's views, they've switched over to video. I can see some people have nearly filled up their paper so far. Excellent. All right, come to a stopping point on the sentence that you're on. I bet you've almost got the page filled if you, if you hadn't already. All right, thank you. In that simulation, you experience the impact that limited word choice can have on writing or limited spelling, where you had to slow down to think about what you were trying to say and accomplish the task that your teacher set out for you. But what you may have produced may not have been any of the ideas that you wanted to say about what you did yesterday. And chances are, if I took a look at your writing, it may look like you didn't try very hard because I know you're bright and intelligent and you could tell me all kinds of great things about what you did yesterday. And I might be able to look at your paper and see that you only wrote a couple things down, maybe even an incomplete sentence. And that was it. So that source of frustration can be hard for students with dyslexia if writing is a task that they're measured on all the time. Thanks, Shelby. So for our next piece, we're gonna kind of walk you through, a lot of times our students are asked to use assistive technology and people don't understand that they're often initially resistant to assistive technology. Um, students don't want everybody to know that they struggle. They don't want to be different. Sometimes it's hard to learn the assistive technology. They need multiple introductions to it to make it really helpful for them. Um, some students just don't want to admit they need help or they don't really understand that they need the help. And a lot of our students don't want to be viewed as a different or learning challenged. So it's, it's very normal to have to try to talk kids into assistive technology and to maybe help prove why they really need it. And it takes, it's a journey for everybody. It's a little different, um, but it's not automatic. So I think a lot of us think that they're just gonna use it and it's gonna make everything better. Um, things to consider when you're choosing this assistive technology, it's not a one size fits all. You'll hear from our panel members that they kind of all use different things. Some of them piece together things some um, use maybe only one or two and they might not use it every day, but it's personal. So um, our students are often at conferences talking to other people and people want them to use their technology and kind of get upset if they don't want to listen to it, but um, everybody uses what works for them. Um, technology, this is often a complaint. It needs to be explicitly taught. So we just assume our parents are going to be able to know it or our teachers are going to know it um, and then they can just show the students. The students need practice and it takes a long time to become proficient. Um, another one of their complaints is that students need the quick access to AT. So a lot of times they'll be in the classroom, um, the teacher will have forgotten to download something, they'll have to go to another room, the computer's not booted up and um, that takes a lot of time and our students lose a lot of valuable instruction time. If, it's, if they don't have quick access to it and that people really know how to help them use it quickly. I'm just gonna go through really quickly and there's tons of assistive technology. These are just the things that our panel um, members happen to be using now. Um, we have audio text, Bookshare, Learning Ally, Libby. Um, Bookshare is free for students under, I think um, K through 12. 
Learning Ally is a paid subscription, and Libby is an app where you can download audiobooks from um, multiple libraries. Then we have our text-to-speech. Our favorites right now are Voice Dream. A lot of our students actually just use Siri. Immersive Reader is another one that um, a lot of our students have been liking. We have a couple students that use the C-Pen Reader because it's fast. Speechify, Browse Aloud, which is on our website if you need to use it um, to access the information, and Read and Write. So for writing, our popular ones right now are Co-Writer, Grammarly, Read and Write, Easy Spelling Aid, Note Taking, Notability, LiveScribe, SmartPen, um, the Microsoft OneNote, Google Keep, um, organizational maps, a lot of our students need to kind of piece together information to be able to recall it later. So inspiration maps, XMind, and then um, multiple tools. So a lot of our students use Google Classroom, Google Suite, or the Microsoft Learning Tools. We don't go into individually each of these things in a lot of detail because it's really a preference and our students will talk about what they use. So I'd like to introduce you to Mac, who's been a student panel member for a couple of years, so that we can talk about his journey to advocacy and to the technology. So Mac, are you on? So Mac, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, hi, my name's Mac, um, I'm 16. Uh, junior at Lake Ridge High School. Um, I love the outdoors. Uh, I'm a competition trap and skeet shooter. Um, yeah, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia in fourth grade. So what do you, um, if you were talking to parents and educators, what's something that's really important that you want them to know about like your journey? What has really Ben, let's talk about what's the worst grade? What's the hardest time that you've had? Um, worst grade or hardest grade would probably be either like fourth or fifth, right around the time I got diagnosed. Um, Cause I didn't really know like what dyslexia, I had no clue what dyslexia was. Um, and then you start learning about it, but you don't know how to advocate. You don't know how to do a lot of things that are really vital to like, I guess succeeding as a dyslexic um but also freshman year of high school just get thrown in the deep end um and i had to figure out a lot of things and a lot of like i guess really had to get to know what dyslexia is and like what i need to succeed and we talk about the label of dyslexia and some parents don't like to give their child the label can you talk about how you feel about the label of having dyslexia? Yeah, I, I like the label because before I had dyslexia, I knew I was dyslexic, um, I was just behind. Um, everyone else in the class could read better. They knew their math facts. I didn't. But when I found out I was dyslexic, there's a reason. Um, it's not just... I'm not, it is a reason that I guess it shows why I'm not having the same level of success when I put in the same, if not more, work. Now talk about advocacy. When did you feel comfortable advocating for yourself? Pretty early on. My mom um, is a teacher, uh, so she jumped on this pretty quickly, um, and she always stressed that I need to advocate for myself. Um, but they were still always there. So I guess I learned how to advocate for myself really as I learned what dyslexia was. Um, but then in high school, um, my mom said, you gotta get it down. You gotta learn how to advocate for yourself fully. So I started having to send my emails to case, man my, uh, case manager for my IEP. Um, emails to teachers when I needed things or had questions, all that stuff, um, all on my own. So that's really when I would say, so I'd say last year when I really got it dialed down all on my own, knew what to do, when to do it. But that started 
as soon as I got diagnosed. So tell us about your strengths. What do you feel your strengths are? Um, I'm a leader. Uh, I, I guess I'm good at ski, <laughs> uh, fishing. I'm determined, positive, adventurous. Um, just go get them. So really an outdoors person, aren't you? Definitely, 100%. So tell us about your challenges. What are the things that are um, hard? Well, reading, spelling, grammar, handwriting, math, all that stuff. Um, none of it's easy. Um, Got to work for all of it. Uh, when it comes to school, there's nothing that really isn't a challenge. And let's let's talk about your assistive technology. Were you excited about using it at first? How long did it take you to become comfortable? Um, well, I never really had a choice. It was, you gotta, you just had to become comfortable because yeah, that's really the only avenue to success that I could see. Um, so it was either you figure out the assistive technology or you keep on having to struggle harder than you really need to. Um, but still at first you just think that, I mean, you're the kid in the back of the class on a computer when nobody else has a computer. You're the kid who gets to use their phone in class when no one else can. You may, you stand out, but I think just the big thing for me was that this is what I need to level the playing field. It doesn't give me any advantage. It doesn't make me anything. It's just that in order to have a level playing field where I can really show that I can do this, I need my tools. Perfect, perfect. Um, so what would you encourage some of the younger students about feeling different? What's one thing that you could say? Um, You're not alone um, and you just have to come to terms with, it doesn't make you different, it's just this is, everyone has their own avenue to success and yours is assistive technology, the tools that you need to get the job done as a dyslexic. Um, you just have to like come to terms with that, realize that that's what you need. So got to do it. So that's one term that our student panel has come up with is you're not alone. A lot of you guys hang out together, talk together. Um, that piece of knowing that somebody else is going through what you're going, do you think that's been important? Definitely, definitely, because I don't have, I mean, before the panel, I, my parent, neither of my parents are dyslexic. Um, my dad thinks that his brother might be, but was never diagnosed. Um, I had no friends. I was the dyslexic kid. Um, but then when I like joined the panel, all of a sudden you see that there's all these other kids who can relate to all these things that I always thought I was the only one who did these things. Um, found out I'm not the only 16 year old who doesn't know left from right. Um, that was a big relief. <laughs> but yeah, just a lot of things that you never realize, like all of a sudden you have this eye opening moment that you're not the only one who experiences these things if you can have a community. Perfect. Um, and one last question. The simulations that Danielle did for us, what, do any of those kind of strike home? Do any of those? Um, well, yeah, all of them. Um, <laughs> they all really like, it's find something that really, it's not, it's just something that I guess I don't do the same. One of the main ones is, I guess that one where you have to write the Welsh while she's talking because my mind's going to be jumping between all the things I have to do and when I start doing multiple things at the same time you don't do them all at the same Perfect. Or you don't do it at the same like caliber that you would okay. you one at a time. so we're going to move on and we're going to talk to Emma next hi Hi, Emma. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about? Yeah. 
Um, so, sorry. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a junior at Corbett High School. Um, I'm 17, and I was diagnosed when I was 14 years old. So, so you, were di you were diagnosed a little bit later. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, totally. So when I was 10 years old, I was diagnosed with auditory processing disorder. Um, so for many, many years, it was a struggle. And then when I got that answer, it really came clear that like, it really it solved a lot of problems, I guess you could say. Um, so that was a, that was like the first winning challenge difference. Um, but I knew like, I think around like 11, 12, I still knew when I got into middle school, I was like, something's still not right. Um, and so we started getting in the process of being like getting diagnosed with like dyslexia. Um, so definitely from like when I was 10, but it definitely took a while for me to like finally have the dyslexia piece into my story. And we talked about um, the hardest time for you. What was the hardest time? Yeah, totally. So my hardest time was like sixth through seventh grade. Um, every conference that my mom and my parents and I went to, my middle school teacher was like, she'll be fine. She'll just catch up. She'll, you know, she'll move on and she'll be fine. And in my middle school, especially, we did a ton of reading. And at the time we didn't know I had, was dyslexic. And so every time he was like, oh, just find a book. She'll, like, she'll move on. She'll catch up. No big deal. And then it was like the last, like the second to last eighth grade conference. And I was like, no, something's not right. Like we need to like change something while well, I'm going to struggle throughout like, whole high school. So definitely sixth through seventh grade and eighth grade, especially when he just kept saying, oh, you'll be fine. You're fine. Like move on. Like, okay, like whatever. But I was like, no, it's not like, it's not fine. So will you share, cause you're comfortable sharing this, um, the anxiety piece. Can you talk about um, when, before you kind of knew things were going on in the younger grades, how it would make you physically ill? Yeah, I had severe and I still, I, I had severe anxiety and I still have anxiety, but not as, tail was it was I would have sick days as we like to call them <laughs> being dyslexic um when I just felt awful like I had like stomach aches headaches like feeling dizzy feeling nauseous like I would just get ill because I did not want to go to school and one of the factors which my mom knows now what she did at the time was every Monday there was like a spelling test and so that caused every Monday to me having severe anxiety and throughout the week in general too, but especially Mondays, my anxiety would flail up. And I think we didn't know at the time that, you know, this was a big deal and that spelling is a big challenge of mine. Okay. So talk about your strengths. You have a lot of strengths. Yeah. Let's hear, let's hear about the good stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. Where do we begin? Oh my goodness. There's so many. I'm pretty, I'm very great advocate for my school from the beginning. They say you need to advocate for yourself and learn how to speak up for yourself. So I'm definitely a great advocate. And um, you started pretty early on that piece, yeah. didn't you? You were started like, a lot earlier than most of our students. So I don't know exact time, but my school definitely was like, you need to advocate. Yeah. Um, I'm extremely hardworking. I will give everything I have, at anything I can do. I like to prove people wrong about dyslexia and life in general about my crazy story that I have. So I'm very hardworking. People think I'm funny. I don't think I'm funny, but I guess people think I'm funny. <laughs> so I, keep, I put that on there. Um, I have a great photographic memory of people. I can tell people from like my childhood, like what their name was, who they like, what they look like, everything. Um, I'm pretty empathetic. Well, not pretty. I'm severely empathetic, just like my mom, actually. I walk into a room and there's stress in the room. I can feel that, like, it's on me, which can come as a strength or a challenge. You can think about it either way. Um, but I'm just severely empathetic, which is, hard, which is hard at times. But I definitely like it. It's nice sometimes. Okay, so tell us about your challenges. Yeah, um, like I said, spelling, grammar is a big one. I've struggled with spelling my whole life and still struggle. Reading, um, like everyone else, reading for me is not a fun thing to do. It's a chore. It's kind of like doing the dishes or doing. It takes so much out of my brain and me to sit down and read a book. So when I find a book that I really like and I can read and I can do it, I'll. It's a good day. <laughs> um, writing essays, I have a really hard time with getting my thoughts onto paper. Just last night, I was filling out application. And I had all these thoughts in my head, but I just couldn't think about how do I process these to like my brain to my head. So that's definitely a big one I struggle with pretty much daily. Um, and one that's not on here that I challenge that I deal with a lot is note taking. I cannot, I need notes ahead of time. I cannot take notes while the teacher is talking, playing a video, especially playing a video. 
you're gonna lose me the first three seconds. Like, it's not an option. Like, I cannot take notes. Um, so getting a big accommodation is getting the notes at a time. And so how do you feel about the label of dyslexia? Yeah, so I think at the beginning, I definitely spent the time very, I, I don't know if I want to say angry, but very, like, confused a little. I, like, kind of knew what was happening, even though I was 14, you know. Um, but I was, like, kind of angry in a way. I was kind of like, why do we spend so many years not knowing? And there was definitely, and there definitely is still a, a ton of self-doubt with it. But now I'm kind of like, now that I meet these people and I talk to these people most days, every day, I'm like, there was people like me everywhere, you know, one in five people were dyslexic. Um, so now I'm more comfortable with it, but it's still not something I introduce myself with, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm dyslexic. It's not just that. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say. Every day is kind of different, depends on the, the situation and person I talk to. Yeah, so everybody has their own kind yeah. of way of thinking about totally. it. So let's talk about your assistive technology. And I want to bring up something. Um, audiobooks don't really work for you. No. And so everybody always says, you know, oh, audiobooks, it's going to fix everything. So um, this, want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, totally. So since I have auditory processing disorder, audiobooks do not work for me. I've tried everything every time, like everything I've tried with audiobooks, they just do not work for me because my brain just can't process it. So it's somewhat easier to read a book or my mom read a book out loud to me. Um, so audiobooks do not work with me. They work with a lot of other students, but they're just not with me. And that's fine. Everyone can have their different technology and, you know, ways they can, you know, help themselves. Um, but audiobooks for me is not the one. But what I do use, um, so all these apps kind of correlate to my iPad and my iPhone that I use pretty much daily for my assignments. So Grammarly is a spelling grammar, punctuation, um, help app you can get down in device and it helps you with like commas, periods, spelling. I even told my dad onto it with joining this panel. It's kind of fun. Now he uses it and he's like, yes, you saved my time. <laughs> it's so nice. So it's kind of nice that way. Um, so Grammarly, spelling, grammar. Google Docs, I will write anything that I can on Google Docs. I can hand write it, but for me, it's so much longer and it just, it's like spelling and grammar, just too many things to do at once. So Google Docs allows me to have the Grammarly on there and then correlate to writing, which is really nice. And then all of the Google apps, like I said, Google Classroom, um, Google Drive, everything I use Google. I'm a Google person. So when did you feel comfortable? What age were you comfortable? And what age were you proficient at using your assistive technology? Um, I don't think that there was a certain age for me, especially since it was only three years ago, so I'm still not a hundred percent. But I've got. I think that. Th I think since I was I know, so late in the game, I guess I was sort of like comfortable with it, and I was sort of used to it in my high school. Um, but I'm no weird nail feeling just whipping out like my iPad in class and doing that. Um, but I feel like I go to a really small school, so everyone pretty much knows when I pull out like, oh, Emma has an IEP. People just know because I go to a really small school. Um, so I don't know. I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not, I'm not half time, but I'm totally the half time. It just depends on the situation. You know, I'm like, oh, I really need help with my essay. I'm going to use it. But I'm like, I can go away without it and not be known. So I think I'm like in the middle. It just depends. Just depends. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Emma. Thank you. We're going to talk to Madeline or Sarah. I'm, yeah, Madeline next. Sorry, guys. Madeline, are you turned on? I didn't know how to unmute it. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Madeline. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Madeline. Um, I go to, I'm a junior in high school, and I go to North Douglas in Drain, Oregon, just a little bump in the road. Um, I was diagnosed in third grade. And so, Madeline, you join us. You, you do three-hour drives to come and participate in all of our activities. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to tell about, um, so Madeline in our group has come up with, she needs her people. So every once in a while, she'll call us if we haven't done something and let us know that um, she needs her people. So tell us how, tell us about that, your people. <laughs> yeah. 
So I feel like people here, I don't really open up to them about my whole dyslexia thing. So it's fun going to see you guys, even though it's three hours in, in the car, I'm not very patient, but whenever I go and see them, it's like, finally, I can like this side that I hide from people here, I can kind of like open up about and be myself. So one of the things that, um, so a lot of our students on our panel feel really comfortable advocating for themselves. Um, and you've been with us for a really long time, but you have a little bit of a different story. You're not super comfortable in the classroom. And can you explain some things that went on why that, that makes that true for you? Yeah, so I've always had like a hard time like advocating for myself just because where I go to school is so tight knit and you know, I'm afraid of like being judged and stuff like that. But you know, whenever I, I was diagnosed, it was hard to like, whenever we told our teachers, Can't really hear you, Madeline. Are you coming back? In last year, um, when I was in language arts class and we were reading um, a book that was, everyone had a part in the book and prior, like we had our IEP meetings and I was like, I'm not reading in front of the class. My teacher knew that. And so she gave me the smallest part. I just thought whenever my part came up, she would read it for me. And so it was the day, you know, in a couple of weeks we were reading the book and it was the day I had high anxiety that morning. And then I walked into the classroom and it was a substitute teacher. So I am horrible, like I just said, advocating for myself, but I decided to go up to her and I was like, my name is Madeline. I have an IEP and on my IEP, it says that I can't read out loud. And she was like, so she was super understanding and she was like, okay, so when your part comes up, I'll read it for you. And so I felt really good. And when we started reading, um, my part came up and she kind of was looking around the substitute teacher and she, and then someone said it was my part and I was like, oh I forgot my book and <laughs> she was like she said you forgot your book and I said yeah can you just read my part for me and she's like no take mine so of course I rejected the book and I was like I can't and then everyone in the background was kind of like Madeline what's the teacher gonna say when she comes back Madeline you can't read Madeline you're gonna be in so much trouble and then at that point I just kind of like shut down and walked myself to the office because I was in trouble <laughs> So it's kind of a struggle sometimes. It's experiences that really kind of put a roadblock to our advocacy. Let's talk about, tell us the things you're good at. Um, stuff I'm good at. Um, I'm good at talking. <laughs> um, I'm good at makeup and hair. I like to go outside, outdoors, ventures. So when we first met Madeline, um, she was really struggling in the younger grades and not feeling like she was good at anything. And um, she asked the panel, she was our young, young one. I think she was like sixth grade and everybody else was in high school. And she said, what is my strength? And everybody turned to her at the same time and said talking. And we often don't think that's a strength, but um, several of our students on the panel kind of were shy to talk. It wasn't that they didn't want to talk. Um, they worried about mixing up their words and saying, you know, syllables wrong, and um, Madeline definitely 100% talking, and, and which we felt is a really amazing gift. So now let's talk about your challenges. Oh, my challenges. Um, spelling, grammar, of course, um, my times tables and stuff like that, and like reading and my writing. My handwriting is not the best. What do you think your worst grade, the worst experience? Everybody has a grade that I think my worst experience is probably like the time I didn't really know what was going on because I kind of thought, you know, I was dumb. Like, why was I made like this and all those horrible things you think when you're little. But then when I finally got um, like the diagnosis, I kind of felt like there was answers and there was things that out there that could help me, even though I didn't know exactly what they were. So you actually didn't mind having the label of dyslexia. You're comfortable with it. Yeah. So let's talk about assistive technology for you. Yeah, so I use um, 
Bookshare and through Bookshare, I use VoiceStream. Why I use that is because I can just, I think the voices sound way better on that. And then um, Office Lens. And the one, that's the one where you can take pictures of like the menus and stuff so you can like read them and you don't have to feel like embarrassed because you have to ask your mom or something. <laughs> and I have been working on a Chromebook for like the past like month, month and a half. <laughs> and I found like there's like an accessibility thing where like you can like it'll read to you. It's like you just have to go into the accessibility thing and like play with it. But there's like different things that I like doing in there like that'll read to you like articles and stuff like that. So um, you kind of came across Office Lens pretty uniquely. We were in Connecticut, right? Yeah. And we got to talk to um, Rachel Berger um, with Microsoft. And you guys had just all gone out to dinner. And can you tell us about um, reading the menu and how that worked for the student <laughs> panel? What did you guys order? Yeah, so we went to, we were staying in, cons in a casino and we chose a pizza place and all the kids were sitting at one table and the adults were sitting at the other table. So whenever we ordered went around the table and we all ordered the same thing we're like i don't think any of us were reading the menu we just kind of copycatted piggybacked off each other and that was really funny because after that i kind of started the conversation do you guys read the menu and the most of the answer was no <laughs> so mostly everybody just went by the picture and then this went with the first person who ordered something right <laughs> yeah and so then you got to experiment a little bit when we were in Connecticut with some different technology. So um, do you encourage kids to maybe try different technologies to find something that works? Yeah, definitely try something. Always try it once. You know, it won't hurt, even if it's not with like your homework or something. Make it fun at first. So are you still kind of resistant to technology in the classroom? Um, yeah, I am. I've started doing um, like going to different rooms to do like to read like my um uh article that we have to read every day and like i get i'm finally starting to get like a chromebook to listen to my audiobook but i'm still kind of like reserved on that type of stuff so growing so it's kind of, yeah it's kind of a journey it's not an automatic thing right yeah um sometimes even if it's on your iep um and you can use it do you feel like your teachers know how to use it yeah no i don't <laughs> um it's just kind of like they're just kind of open to anything they're trying to find the best, but they're not actively trying to find the best. They're just kind of open to it type okay. thing. Okay. So anything else you want to share with us? What's the best part? What's the best thing that it's happened for you in your dyslexia journey? Mm -hmm. Probably meeting you guys. <laughs> so really just that comfort of, um, and you were, you were one of the people that came up with you're not alone. You were on yeah. that panel. Um, what does that mean to you when you say um, you're not that, alone? Um, that kind of like there are people out there even though like even I know if like you're somewhere else the kind of message to give to people is that you aren't the only one there are people out there even though it might not feel like it whenever you're down on yourself just remember that keep that in your head perfect all right so we're going to move on to Sarah so can Sarah unmute yeah there we go so Sarah tell us a little bit about yourself Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm a sophomore at Washougal High School. I am 15, and I was diagnosed in third grade with dyslexia. So what do you think about the label of dyslexia? How do you, how do you feel about it? I think that it gives me a relief that knowing that, like, why I can't read as well as others is because I have dyslexia. So it's definitely a relief to know that there's something that I wasn't comprehending. And what do you think your worst grade, hardest time um, you've had? I would probably say middle school, just because that's when you start to use your technology. That's when you start to depend on technology more and that your teachers aren't there on you more than one-on-one. -on -one. So I think middle school is definitely a struggle. And so you've spent a lot of time in tutoring. So a lot of people listening, um, do you feel like you got help at school or was it mostly outside for the reading and spelling issues? Well, I think it was definitely more outside of school because my school was not willing to say that I have dyslexia. They weren't willing to use that word. So it was definitely more outside that helped me read. And how many years of tutoring did you do? Five and a half. Five and a half. So it was a lot of time spent 
Yes. So tell us about your strengths. All right. My strengths are sports. Um, I play two club sports, uh, interior design and organization. And tell us um, a little bit about your challenges. So my challenges are spelling, grammar, and reading. I would also say memorizing times tales and just really anything in school. And so a lot of people assume like you've got through tutoring, it's supposed to be easier because you know, you can read and um, can you explain how that maybe not necessarily things that you're still struggling with, even though you can read okay? Yeah, it's definitely not something you'll totally be able to overcome. And I think that tutoring definitely helps, but I think your technology is really what's going to be the key to help you. And as an advocate, we talked about you kind of can be a little reluctant too because of past experiences. Um, when you were advocating for yourself, when you were trying to um, get some things done in middle school. And can you tell us kind of what happened there? Oh, yeah, definitely. So I think it's the atmosphere that puts kids against using technology. So when I was in middle school, I was in science class. And this was one of my first times advocating for myself. And I got an assignment in uh, science. And I asked the teacher to help me read it because I didn't understand. And he told me that they're just words and that I should know how to read them. So it's definitely the atmosphere that makes kids want to not advocate for themselves. So let's, let's move into um, the technology piece. Do you feel proficient? Um, I would say proficient in technology, but not proficient in using the technology in the classroom. Okay. And what technology is your favorite? Uh, my technology that's my favorite is easy spelling. So I know some people prefer uh, Siri, but I definitely think that uh, easy spelling listens to kids' voices better. So it's just easy to really pull out quick, say a word to it, and have it spell it for you. So that's why I like to use it, because it's quick and easy. So a lot of our students, that's one of their favorite, just because it's easy. Not because it does a lot, but it's just a quick, easy fix. Um, you have an interesting one, and I think a lot of people don't know this. Talk about how Google Translate can help you. Yeah, so there's plenty of apps out there where you can take a picture and it'll read back to you, but uh, Google Translate does the same thing. So if you set it English to English, you can take a picture, highlight it, and it will read it out to you. And the thing about Google is that there's so many voices you can choose from, because I know some people don't like the computer voice. So that's why I use Google Translate, because it's just quicker and easier than the other apps. Okay, and you said it English to English again, right? Like you yeah, said? Yeah, English to English. And then you'll take a picture, highlight it, and then I'll just read it back to you. Okay. And what about the you're not alone? How did that make, you were part of that coming up with that. What does yeah. that help? How does that help? Yeah, it definitely helps because there's so many other kids out there who are struggling with what you, like with dyslexia. And I think that knowing that you're not alone will definitely help you advocate and it will help you like know that when you're sitting in class and you're struggling taking notes that there's probably another kid in that class that's feeling the same way you are. And I know a lot of times we talk about the bad things that happen in the classroom and things that are hard. Can you do a shout out to somebody that's really changed your life in the classroom, like oh, at definitely. school that's really helped you? So my caseworker in middle school, Miss Montana, and then my caseworker now in high school, Mr. Moore, I think it's just because they're so, like, invested in you. Um, they'll come to my meetings with me, with my teachers. They'll make sure that I have the notes. Like, they won't go. Like, they won't leave that classroom until I have the stuff I need. And um, how does that make you feel? Does it just kind of change your attitude about talking up and yeah, speaking it up? it definitely changes your attitude. It gives you a strength that I think helps me. Because when I'm down and then that teacher's in there making sure that I'm getting the work, that I need and the time I need, it helps me. So thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. So we're going to be moving on to Macy. Hi. Hi, Macy. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Macy. Um, I go to Cleveland High School and I'm a sophomore. I was diagnosed in the fourth grade, at the end of the fourth grade, and I've been on the panel since the eighth grade. So tell us about how you felt with the label of dyslexia. Um, at first, it was 
it was kind of weird. I didn't feel totally comfortable telling my friends. Um, but after just a few months, I felt very comfortable in it. And it was kind of, it was a good thing because it, it made me feel like my challenges weren't so much me, but my dyslexia and I could pin it on something. It wasn't just me being not so smart. So you had a kind of funny, um, the glitch. Can you tell us about the glitch? <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the first grade, um, my first grade teacher came to my parents and basically told them that I was learning much slower than other kids and that there was probably a learning disability going on. Um, but my parents knew me and they were like, if we tell her she has a learning disability like dyslexia, she's not going to understand what that means. Um, but they knew I would understand what a glitch was, like in a computer or something. So they said my brain just had like a slight glitch that made it harder for me to learn. And so um, I guess uh, up until the fourth grade when I was diagnosed, people would ask me, well, like, why aren't you doing this? And I'd be like, well, I have a glitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's perfect. So tell us about your some of your strengths. Um, so I would say my strengths are running. I really love running. Um, in the third grade, I joined something called Girls on the Run. And it was just, it was such a blessing for me because I needed something to be proud of and feel confident in outside of school. And that was what it was. And so I've been running since the third grade and that's just a huge strength. Um, and another strength is my writing, not necessarily like grammar and spelling and all of that, but just being creative and coming up with the stories is really fun. So, and that kind of, when you talk about that with the other panel members, they kind of get a little jealous, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's very, definitely not the most common thing for a dyslexic to say that they like writing. Um, but I guess for me, at least, it's, it's just a helpful way to kind of like get out of the real world and just write what I'm feeling. So, so and I think it's important for people to hear that um, you enjoy writing and you're good at it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we just we kind of label. So if you, if you have dyslexia, you can't write, you can't take Spanish, you can't, you know, do what you can't, you can't. Yeah. And um, it's just so, everybody's so individual. And I think totally. that sometimes we need to stop saying you can't, it might be hard. Um, so I love that you love to write. So tell us about some of your challenges. Um, some of my challenges are definitely spelling. Um, I've never been good at spelling and grammar and reading. Reading has always probably been one of the harder things for me, along with math um, and note taking as well. Just like seeing things up on the board and taking them down because that's a mixture of things because you're, you're writing, like you're using spelling and so no one else could read my notes. Um, and it's just, you have to write really quickly and that doesn't, my brain doesn't process as quickly as other brains. Okay, and so that kind of maybe leads into your worst experience, um, your worst grade in school. Yes. Can you talk a little about that? Um, so I guess in the third grade, um, we were doing times tables, multiplication. Um, and I am not good at multiplication. I was never very good at multiplication and I couldn't memorize the things. I, I didn't understand what multiplying was. Um, and so for each week, we would have a test at the end of the week that was like your, your ones, your twos, your threes, up until your twelves. Um, and for each test that you passed, you would get something on an ice cream sundae. And at the end of the unit, you would have an ice cream sundae. And it was my biggest fear that I would only have ice cream because that's the only thing you got, you know. <laughs> um, and I guess that was just, that was really a hard time for me because it was like, I didn't want to be different than others and I didn't want them to see me as less. Okay, so, and that happens a lot to students they have those little parties, those little incentive parties. Um, if they work hard enough, they get to go to the Friday something. And then I think a lot of students with dyslexia, there's that ex expectation that they haven't been working hard. Can you talk about maybe how that's not true? Like you're working twice as hard and how it's really more of a time issue? Yeah, so I mean, for me, I remember coming home from school, walking home, and I would tell my mom, I'm working twice as hard. I'm working 10 times harder than everyone. And why am I not, why am I still doing less than them? Why am I still getting worse grades? Um, and I guess for me, it was like, if you give me 10 minutes and you give everyone else 10 minutes, 
I'm just not going to complete the work in 10 minutes. But if you give me 20 minutes, I'm going to complete the work. And it's, it has the possibility to be better even because I, I do have the possibility for greatness. I just need more time. And then tell us about your favorite assistive technology. Yeah, um, I love audiobooks uh, like Bookshare and Read to Go. Um, they've been, really been a lifesaver, especially um, in middle school and now in high school. Um, just reading like any sort of textbooks because they come on Bookshare and Read to Go. And also easy spelling aid because I've always struggled with which there's the right there and which which is the right which and things like that. So um, you were just, we were just at a conference presenting and you learned about a new technology that you haven't got to try yet because of school then was let out and um, yes. we're not going, but can you talk about like learning new technology or always looking for it um, and kind of encourage kids maybe that you'll find something that you like better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, before I was on the panel, I've been to a lot of the panels um, to see technologies and it took a while to find the right technologies. Um, but I think you just keep looking through random things, you know, research, going to panels. And I really believe there's something out there for everyone because there's just so much technology. And then do you want to talk about you're not alone, how that makes you feel? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, everyone, I would say most people that are dyslexic that I've run into, they feel so like they're, they're the only one that feels this way. Um, and it's really, it's just not true at all. You know, in elementary school and in middle school, until I joined this panel, I thought I was the only one. But now I come to find out, I'll say I'm dyslexic in a classroom setting and 10 other people raise their hand saying I'm dyslexic too. And suddenly they feel confident enough to tell me their stories. And I think that's really a good thing because everyone else feels more confident in themselves and like they're not alone. Perfect, thanks Macy. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk to Meg next. Meg is new to our panel. This is her first presentation where she's speaking in front of a group. Hello. Hi, Hello. Meg. Hi. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Meg. I'm a freshman. I go to Newburgh High School, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia in the fifth grade. So we talked about um, the label of dyslexia. How did, how did that make you feel? Um, I didn't really start embracing it until eighth grade because I used to go to a really small school where they didn't um, provide accommodations. They didn't even really think dyslexia was a real condition, honestly. So um, it made, made it a little tough? It was really tough because our classes were so small and I was always the one who was struggling and I felt ashamed that I was struggling and I never wanted to tell people that I was. So when you got to eighth grade, you said kind of everything got a little bit better, right? Yeah, a Wanna lot tell, better. Tell us why. I got to start using technology for the first time. Um, I never got to use it before at my old school. And so I had to learn how to use everything. But as soon as I started figuring it out, I learned that there was such a thing called spell check. <laughs> and that <laughs> really helped. It was li that's going to be life-saving, can it? <laughs> So let's talk about some of your strengths. Um, I love doing various forms of martial arts, or climbing and fishing, and I also love writing stories. Not so much the writing it down, but I constantly have a story going on in my head. And then what about some of your challenges? Um, the kind of usual with dyslexia, spelling, grammar. Um, I also have a visual processing disorder, which makes note taking and reading even harder. Okay. And then I have a lot of trouble with advocating for myself because I went through so many grades without knowing how to. And so when you're talking about advocacy, where do you think you're at in your journey? Are you more at the beginning? Are you getting more to the intermediate? Um, yeah, I'm kind of at the beginning. The beginning. Yeah. And so I think for a lot of educators and parents, we just need to hear that it's a growth. A lot of times they're like, well, you just have to advocate for yourself. Um, and that might not work for everybody, especially if you're an introvert and you're a little yeah. shy. It's, it can be really tough. It's and it terrifying. Could take, it could take a good couple of years to, um, to work on that. And I've just seen in the last two times 
that we've met, like it's gotten, you've just gotten a lot more talkative. Um, do you think it's because you're hanging around other kids? Yes, similar? absolutely. Yeah. I've always wanted to find a community where I felt more comfortable talking about my struggles. And then I found this group and it just clicked and I felt so much more comfortable talking. You know, and for myself, just being around you guys, I always talk about um, the back seat dyslexic because I'm driving people around to things. And I've learned more about dyslexia by just listening, just listening to the conversations, um, things that maybe I didn't know before. Um, and it's, it's been really nice actually for me also to um, listen to your stories, to see how things are really working. Um, kind of almost like you guys are the experts on dyslexia. And I think that we really need to listen to the students more. So let's talk about um, your moving to a public school. Um, yeah. Let's talk about how that changed for things for you. Um, I got a 504 plan, which really helped with reading and spelling. I never used to have that. And I was suddenly surrounded by a lot of kids who were at the same level as me. I wasn't used to that. So it just made it easier. Yeah. And there were teachers who actually understood what I was going through and they were willing to support me in any way they could. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah. So let's talk about your favorite technology. Um, I use Grammarly all the time and Google Read and Write to help me get through like when I have to read articles or different books. I like reading, but only when it's something that's super interesting to me. Otherwise, it's just a pain. Okay. And then I use Bookshare all the time. And so you got an opportunity um, to present a little bit about your technology. And um, at our last little conference, and mm -hmm. we talk about a lot of people will expect when you're presenting for you to be an expert. <laughs> and um, we kind of laugh because really we're, we, we see ourselves as the consumers, the consumers of what yeah. we're going to do with that, um, that we don't have to know everything about everything. Um, we just have to know about what we use and be open. Did you learn anything new? Did you find anything that you might like to try? Um, yeah, I have a huge list of stuff I was going to try, but then schools got closed. Right, right. So I think that's important, too, that we're always learning. Thank you, Meg. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to talk to Bella. And Bella is very brand new. This is her first time um, with us. So that's kind of exciting. Can you unmute Bella? Uh, yeah. So Bella, do you want to tell us about yourself? Um, uh, I'm 13. I got diagnosed with dyslexia in sixth grade, in the middle of sixth grade. And I got to Tuolumne Middle School. And you were talking about um, how you felt when you, with the label of dyslexia. You, you didn't really mind it, did you? No, not really. And you told me about your worst, your worst um, grade. You said it was something to do with third grade because of chapter books. Can you explain that? Well, I, I think it was third grade because everybody was like getting into chapter books and I wasn't and it, it made it more difficult to, it made it feel like I wasn't progressing as much as I should be. And I think that's where a lot of students really start to notice is that they're still on these books that they might consider a little babyish and their friends are reading these chapter books. And then you'll have one or two kids in the class that are reading the big chapter books. So it, it can be a little bit, cause a little bit of anxiety, right? Yeah. A little overwhelming. Um, tell us about your best grade. Um, my best grade. Um, you were talking about seventh grade. Seventh, yeah, probably seventh. That was pretty good grade. And you talked about how you maybe realized other people had dyslexia. Oh yeah, so in seventh, I, um, I was put into this class called Read One Eighty to help with uh, being dyslexic, and that's when I found a bunch of other kids who were also dyslexic who were in that class. And how does that make you feel? The community part is really important, isn't it? Uh, it makes you feel a lot better that there's other people who, like, understand what you're going through. All right. 
So I'm going to move on to your slide of things that you're strength that you're good at. Uh, I'm good at uh, music. Uh, the drums is what I've been practicing the most while being in quarantine. Um, I go on bike rides when it's nice outside. I do a lot of art. Uh, I play basketball and do some other sports. So you're more of a sports person. That's really kind of your outlet. So tell us about your challenges. Um, writing essays, not taking spelling and reading. Uh, and you had listed for me book reports. Oh, yeah. Do you, well, do, you, do you think those are like for every student with dyslexia like that is like, ugh, book oh, yeah. report? Book reports are not fun at all. They just not fun. And so when we talk about this advocacy piece, do you consider maybe yourself at just the beginning level? You're just kind of getting used to it? Yeah, I'm just barely. And so and we're excited to have you in our group. We're excited to watch you grow and, um, and help you with your journey. So it's kind of fun for us to see that you. Um, so Bella was going to maybe just sit and watch. And then all of a sudden we knew she was going to present and sign up. So that was really exciting for the rest of us to see because that's kind of when we know that you're ready to start moving into that journey. So let's talk about your assistive technology. Um, I use voice to text in Google Classroom, uh, in Google Docs and stuff like that. It, I feel like it helps organize better than writing it all down on paper. Um, I use voice to text when I don't know a word or how to spell it. Uh, and I'll just say it and it'll uh, give me the right spelling usually. Perfect. So would you say in assistive technology, are you at the beginning of your, or are you pretty comfortable with it? I have your... the beginning. Beginning. Okay. And so are there some other things that you're kind of looking, we're trying to hopefully we'll be able to meet in person again and get you to figure out some other things that you might like. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bella. Yeah. We are going to hear from Kimia next. So Kimia, can you turn on? Hi. Hi, Kimia. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, I'm Kimia. I'm in the eighth grade. I go to iTech preparatory. Um, I got diagnosed with dyslexia when I was like in the first or second grade. So tell us, you have kind of, tell us your family history. Tell us um, okay. a little bit. So um, my mom and so my, both my grandparents on my mom's side are dyslexic. So my mom's dyslexic and my dad is a little bit dyslexic. So both my parents are dyslexic. My older brother's dyslexic. I'm dyslexic and my younger sister's dyslexic. And so tell us the family struggle. So you have... Um, your dad's a physician, your brother wants to be a physician. And so you've kind of got really slammed with dyslexia. <laughs> you got the most serious. So we always talk yeah. to everybody that you can have, it's kind of on a curve. So you can have a little bit, a lot. So um, you have everything. So tell me how that feels when you're in a family where your, your siblings are slightly dyslexic, um, but you have all of the struggles. Uh, yeah, so, um, with my siblings and my mom, they, at like the age of 10, it clicked for them and they started to get how to read. And they, now all of them read for fun. Um, they read all the time. But me, I'm 14 and it still hasn't clicked. I okay. still don't enjoy reading. I, it still takes me 45 minutes to read two pages. And you've been in tutoring for a really long time. And so, um, you know, after school for a while there, almost every day. So it's not like you haven't been trying, right? So a lot of people will say, oh, she's not trying, but they were trying harder. It's just a little bit harder for you. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about your strengths. Yeah, so my strengths, I'm really good at art soccer, swimming. I really love the outdoors. I have a cabin and I love to spend time at my cabin. Um, I'm really funny. I can make a lot of people laugh pretty easily. Uh, 
and I'm really hardworking. I don't quit. I persevere. Yeah. You, you do work hard because you're constantly, constantly working. So tell us about your challenges. Um, note taking, especially right now, since I'm going into high school next year, I have a really hard time because I, if I can't spell, I can't spell without looking at a word and then copying it down. But if I keep on looking at the board while they write it down and then looking back, I um, will get really, really bad headaches from glancing up and down and up and down for every letter. Also, by the time I finish my first word, they've already erased the whole sentence. Okay. So, so I get notes provided for me. So when we talk about advocacy, I've, I've known you for a really long time and you just were an advocate from like day one. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Do you think it's because of your family history? Um, so I did when I was um, younger, I did go to a very small private school and it was, uh, I think it was easier for me to open up because everyone was my friend and there were a lot of people there that had, that had learning disabilities. So I had, from the start, I had a really good community around that. So now I am basically like my name and then dyslexia, dyslexic under it, under it. I don't know what I would be like without dyslexia. It's something that has shaped my personality. And I, so I, I find you a very strong um, with your people skills, being able yeah. to make people help you and explain what you need. So I think that's important that you're more on the extrovert. So the advocacy comes a lot easier for you. So um, you, this is the part that we have struggled trying to get you to use some assistive technology and you probably have been the most resistant. Um, but all of a sudden this year, tell us why you're using it. Um, so before this year, I know how to use it. It just takes longer for me to do it. And um, it was really hard to start doing it in class, but this year, since I'm going to a different school and my school is a STEM school, everyone is using technology all the time. So I don't stand out and but basically all my teachers know how to use the technology. And it's just kind of like everyone gets out their computer in the beginning of the class and then I don't stand out. Um, and it's, it just has been easier to work it into every day. And so we have talked about, it's really that teacher knowledge. They know how to use the technology, so they're able to help you use it quicker and faster, right? Um, yeah. Because before, you know, at the school, not everybody was really into technology, they didn't know how to use it. Um, if you're not using it day to day, it's really hard to learn how to become proficient, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. So um, your favorite new technology? Um, immersive Reader is definitely my favorite new one because so Immersive Reader, all you have to do is you highlight it and then you like, I think right click and it says, help me read this. And so you click it and it just brings all the text you highlighted into a separate document, spaces it, puts it in the font you like, and then it will read it to you. And it has Perfect. like an actual voice. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kimia. My we're pleasure. Gonna, we're gonna talk to Jared. And our students always love to hear um, Jared because he got through school. He did his end of the journey. <laughs> And it's, it's nice to kind of hear um, the slides really important, I think, for a lot of our students to hear all of these amazing accomplishments that he's made. And it still was hard for him. So they like just that determination. So Jared, do you want to talk a little bit? Sure. First, I, I just think that the work you're doing with these students is so awesome. And to hear all of them tell their stories today was just really powerful for me as well. So. Just and you and I have shared that it's that story. Like when you know your story, you can advocate for yourself. And when you know your story, you can feel good about yourself. You really have to know your story. Definitely, definitely. Um, 
I guess mine starts when I was five years old and um, that's when I was diagnosed with dyslexia in the eye doctor's office. Um, and back then we didn't know much, you know, we didn't know anything. And fortunately, like my mom and my dad jumped right on it and tried to figure it out. But we joked that they put our, my educational program together with a uh, duct tape and shoestring as we kind of tried to figure it out with tutors and, um, um, I, I had probably what they refer to as dyspraxia now, but I needed occupational therapy as well. The running joke in my family was if I, if somebody opened the car door, tied my shoes and took me to the soccer field, I could figure out how to play the game, but it was like <laughs> getting there, that was such a process. Um, and sometime, somewhere along, I believe it was like in the third grade, they'd have the IEP meetings and uh, I got wind that somebody made the comment that I probably wouldn't graduate uh, high school and not for my parents not to expect above a C average. And I think just hearing that, like it just, as a kid, you just take those words and you say like, well, this isn't going to happen. And it really developed a chip on my shoulder. And I think a lot of like the students on the line is it took a while for my, for everything to kind of finally click. But in high school, I, I was able to kind of put it together and ended up graduating high school, going on to USC, earning a master's in communication management from USC, as well as eventually an MBA from Seattle Pacific while working full time. Wow. So um, our kids like this part too, because your challenges and strengths are quite the kind of the same as theirs. So tell us. Yes. I mean, spelling, definitely a challenge. Uh, the whole left to right thing can still trip me up when I'm running on the trail and need to tell somebody I'm passing. Like, it takes me a minute to tell somebody left or right. Uh, reading menus is crazy hard for me. It, <laughs> I've been in situations where I've ordered the same thing that the other person ordered, even though I didn't like the food. Um, just because it's it takes a while for me to like read a menu and process and figure it all out. So there's definitely those challenges that still exist today for sure. And then um, assistive technology for you, you had something exciting happen. Yeah, I mean, so this whole work from home situation really got me playing around with the tools, um, different, different assisted technology. And I really was able to find that immersive reader it's such a benefit to me um, in that I'm, you know, I can have my emails read to me. They come across in the dyslexia font. So that's really great. So um, I know that we're all dealing with a, a tumultuous time right now. And to be able to, I guess, find some tools that are helpful, maybe a little bit of a silver lining. And I, I think it's important for, um... I guess teachers and parents and even other people with dyslexia, it's, we all go through these periods of where we have the anxiety, we're not gonna, you know, and then we conquer it. And then sometimes they think that everything's gonna be great. And then we find something new that's a little bit harder, a new environment. Um, so do you feel just like that you're not alone? Just really makes a difference? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I go back to, when I was the age of a lot of the students on the line, like I didn't know anyone that was dyslexic. It was like, I think I met one person who was in grad school uh, when I was like 11 years old. Um, but I really felt alone in the process. And I think as you get older and you're kind of seeing, wow, this really affects a lot of people there is something to this you are not alone campaign that we're doing and really bringing people together and building a community. And I think to that note, like a lot of the things, the endeavors that I've chased, um, I think it partakes because now I realize there's a community of people that are dealing with this. I think it's so important to be um, giving back in, in, in a positive way, so. And then we talk about our journey to assistive technology. Um, so you can kind of talk to our students how lucky they are to use these opportunities because um, when did really assistive technology in your educational career come 
<laughs> well, I got the books on tape, but they came in the cassette, so you could never like mark <laughs> your place. But I, I would say this to the students that are going through it now, like I, I can never fully, I would never fully say it's like easier or they have a better time with it. They're all working, they're all putting in tremendous effort um, beyond the, the neurotypical student. And even though they may have a, uh, the assistive technology might be a, a little bit easier to use or more user friendly, I should say, um, they're still but they're still in the battle of it so they have my utmost respect perfect so we're gonna we're gonna move on to the end and um let jared talk a little bit about our instagram live that we've just started yeah so we've uh in order to get back to this community you know we'd be doing these um around the state we'd be going and doing these in, in a physical environment so um part of the Instagram lives that are happening at seven o'clock on Monday nights um, on the at dyslexia, you are not alone um, Instagram handle is that we're sharing these uh, students journeys. And so we're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews and it's, and we, we had a mom on, we were, I think gonna eventually have a, a sibling on so we can really kind of peel back the layers of, of what this all means. And in our You're Not Alone campaign, if you have a student that's feeling really left out and lonely, um, that doesn't think that they have anybody else with dyslexia, write to us and let us know. We would love to send them one of our bracelets. Um, and a quick note, our students love to support other students um, um, in that. So let's talk about um, this exciting thing too, Jared, your contest. Yeah, so this past fall we wrote, or I wrote the book, uh, Running the Distance. Uh, it was published by the International Dyslexia Association and a uh, tremendous editor and Denise who's at home office. Um, and we're giving away copies. Um, and the, the Oregon branch is agreed to match the one don donation. So we're gonna pick two winners on May 9th. Um, but it's really go to um, all you have to do is go to the at running the distance book Instagram handle, um, like it, the page. You'll see a picture of a monitor. Um, go like that post, tag two friends, and write done, and then you'll be entered in the raffle. So we're we're excited for that. And I wanted to say one thing about the scholarship is is part of this running the distance campaign. The scholarship is, is we create it in a way that it's user friendly for this, um, for this community. So it's, it's really, you know, make sure that you go check it out if it, if it applies or you know somebody that might be able to um, apply for it because we really tried to make it user friendly. And if you're looking for a way to help support our students, this scholarship is an amazing, um, it's amazing to me because a lot of times when you see a scholarship, it's just for college. And I love that this scholarship also includes trade schools and other things. And so our students, um, people are always asking, how can we support you? Um, what can we do for you? Um, help us with the scholarship if you can. It um, really pays it forward for us. Definitely. So let's, um, this is how you can find us. It's probably easier if you go on our webpage, but we do have um, our dyslexia, you're not alone. So if you have a student age group, um, I know somebody had just asked a question about what social media our students use. Most of them are on Instagram. Um, follow us, our students will reply to you um, on this dyslexia, you're not alone. Um, and maybe watch them on Monday nights. So yeah. it's kind of a good thing. Um, we've we've kind of adopted a couple little members um, our group is a eighth through um 12th grade um but we've we've ran into some younger students that we will once in a while send an extra video to and so if you need that kind of help really reach out to us because we'll be glad to help you um, we're on facebook um our students tell us that's kind of for old people so they don't really <laughs> use it much <laughs> and um we do have a new youtube page um, that we're going to hopefully post this um, presentation. And um, if we can get 100 people to subscribe, we can get a better, easier 
quicker um, YouTube name. So please help us with that if you can. And um, we are also on Twitter. Um, we thank you for being a part of our journey. We love um, that our students can tell our journey. Um, and we really want people to know they're not alone. And we have gotten some questions here. So um, I'm going to take a minute and see if we can answer a couple of these questions. So um, I think this one is for Emma. If you could click back on. Um, there's somebody that is an assistive technology specialist Ooh. and and they want to know what exactly happens that causes you the challenges of using the audiobooks. Yeah, so since I have auditory processing disorder, my brain can't process information. Um, like it can't process information. So my so I can hear perfectly fine. I don't. I have no hearing issues. So my brain can't process the audiobooks. Um, so I can't process the reading the book. Um, it just doesn't comprehend in my brain. I guess is the way to put it. Like, so it's just. It's not yeah, I think it's just part of being my auto, I have my auditory processing disorder. It's not, yeah. Okay. So, so I don't the best answer, but that's what I got. <laughs> no, and I think just it, some things don't work for some people. Yeah. Um, we have some students on our panel that can't follow along with a book when it's highlighted um, in, in a book because they don't have enough attention to pay attention to what the words are saying and mm -hmm. the screen. So some of our students that are um, severely ADHD have a hard time doing that. So we have another question, um, and this might be maybe a good one for Mac. So if Mac wants to come on, um, do dyslexic kids use social media groups to network with other kids to build a community? Um, yeah, I mean, part of it is a lot of, I guess, how friends work for us i mean i know basically everyone on the panel if they have instagram we all are friends on instagram we all follow each other um but that's also a good way i know we have a couple of group chats that like sometimes like i guess someone will say something or point out something and kind of we'll have conversations and stuff in those and i feel like that's it's a good way to connect with people because especially these days, you can't, you can't see people. You can't, all, I can't always hang out with people. I'm pretty busy. Um, but to be able to just jump into something or reach out to someone um, quickly can be helpful. Yeah. All right. So I think that social media piece, um, I was not an Instagram person and the students set up that for me. And I found a lot of really interesting pages of people who had um, dyslexia that we have all started to follow. So that's kind of, um, it's kind of a good resource because it can be quick when you want it to be and you can just check in. Um, you don't have to identify yourself, but you can kind of follow. So um, do we have any other questions? Is there anything that we haven't answered? Am I missing anything? There'll be, yeah, can you hear me? This is yep. Daniel. Yes, so there's one that moved into the answered column um, because I said, I hope we get to this one. Um, uh, Melanie typed a, a question that I think we can answer in more detail after this event, and we'll do that. But generally, okay. um, it's about schools not letting her daughter have any assistive technology or even a human reader during the English language arts testing. And the principal had said, that's just how it is. And we expect that kids with dyslexia will do poorly and you know, that's it. So do we have any student that can talk about accommodations that they've gotten on any standardized testing like, uh, what is it, Smarter Balance or anything else? Have you had readers? Can I chime in there? Yeah, sure. Um, for a while I did those and that's the same, same thing they told me. Um, you can't, you can't have anything. Um, you can't really do anything. And that, it doesn't, it didn't ever feel good. I hated it because I'm not one to just sit back and allow myself to fail. And you get put in kind of like a stuck between a rock and a hard place because there is no option. And I'm, I, now I don't, I am exempt from them. Um, but 
for yeah it's just it's it's one of those things where yeah because we're all trying to have this i mean we're all learning how to advocate for ourselves and like show that we can succeed but then they the school told me at least that yeah you're expected to fail and i did fail i failed a lot of them um but yeah i never never got any um help on them any of the things that i need for success which then it doesn't effectively measure anything for me it just shows that i can't read well write well things like that yeah totally i'm first off i would say i'm sorry that's awful news to have your daughter or your son hear that you know they're not like they can't use this um i was very lucky to have technology since day one since i started doing um standardized tests so i've always had the option to have audiobooks um separate setting uh what else? i don't know, just i haven't done it in a few years just i think the biggest thing is just fight for your child and fight and that they need that and it can make a big difference i took the sat just about a month a month and a half ago and i got a separate setting um mer obviously more time more time for me is huge on those long big tests um audiobooks if i need it, audiobook the test if i needed it so just fight for your kid and just tell them like this is gonna make i don't say make a break but this is gonna make a huge impact in the ch in my child's succeeding or you know not doing so well so that's like my input okay and so somebody has a question for mac about how did you um exempt from standardized testing how did that happen um did your mom sign you out yeah yeah my, i mean my mom's a principal now and she's she just kind of had enough of it um because it's just it, it ain't it ain't fun um to go into something knowing you're gonna fail so i think a she took me out of it because oh, it's gonna wear you down pretty quick um and then b she took me out of it because all it does is it, it I mean, it's because I know I was thinking about it before schools got closed because I was looking forward to the couple of days I was going to get off for testing because <laughs> uh, I was just not going to go to school. Um, and I was messing with my friends about it. They aren't dyslexic, so I was messing with them about how I'm going to get a second spring break. Um, but yeah, I know, I don't know exactly how she got me exempt um but yeah so, she did. it's a big help so as a parent you can sign your child you can have them exempt yeah. the school will tell you no the school will but you can as a parent it is your mm -hmm. right and um, danielle do you want to talk a little bit about that i just type the response yes a parent can opt out and okay. even if they resist it, it they're just trying to slow you down but you may opt out for your student of any standardized testing and then Jared, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I remember those tests and taking them at that age and just knowing that you're going into a situation where you can't win and then getting the results just had such a negative impact on me. And so I think if there are ways to work with the school and, uh, like the students were saying and Danielle and you, like if there's ways for the parents to advocate and remove their student from that situation, I think it, it actually serves a purpose. I'm all for challenges and pushing through hard things, but sometimes there's games where the board is too stacked against you to even uh, get a fair play. And, and I believe those are one of them. Yep. Now we have a question for Sarah. So Sarah, could you log back on? So, Sarah, the question was for you that um, somebody's daughter will not let them use the word dyslexia. Their school doesn't believe in it. Um, and they just call it a specific learning disability. Any advice on how to? Yeah, so I think that 
like um, Emma was saying earlier, that you just need to fight for it. Like, you need to know that, like, there's other kids out there, that there's other kids, too. There's other schools that won't use the word dyslexia, and you just need to fight it. And so, Sarah, you kind of had, Sarah kind of, she's kind of, if you get on her, she's going to push back. And so um, they would always say, and I don't know if she remembers this, specific learning disorder, and she'd say, yeah, my dyslexia. So every time they used that label, she would include, yeah, my dyslexia, dyslexia. And her mom was brilliant at this. Her mom was always saying, oh, you mean dyslexia? Oh, you mean like, so her mom would always put that word in, even if they didn't want to. Yeah, um, I definitely think pushing it is yeah. what you need to do. So anytime. Um, the nice part is in Oregon, you can say dyslexia. Actually, um, Danielle, do you want to talk a little bit about this? You can say dyslexia because... Of, we have a law, but also nationally it's recognized. So they can't say that it's not dyslexia. I know they can't diagnose for dyslexia. Right. Know? There's um, guidance from the U.S. Department of Education directing um, all schools that they um, should not shy away from using that word and that it's perfectly acceptable to name what it is. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a letter by Michael Uden from the uh, U.S. Department of Education that is nice to have on hand when you have, you know, when you're faced with um, that type of response. I see that we have um, another question that wasn't answered, but um, I feel like we should wrap it up for, for those who are, you know, mindful of their time. But know that, like, Tina, I see that you have a question about assistive technologies for students you wished you had in third and fifth grade. We'll pull our students and then I'll, I'll answer that question in a follow-up email um, along with a copy of the slides that have the information from tonight um, to every attendee. And we thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for the story. If you have a question that you think about tomorrow, the next day, just reach out to us. Um, our students are really, really happy to help you. Um, if you want to talk with a student or have your, um, your student talk with a student, just let us know. We'll write a quick note, do a FaceTime. And um, thank you, everybody.